Hey everyone, my name is Eric and I'm one of the TAs for this course and a graduate student in the Social and Personality Psychology program here at York, uh, supervised by Dr. Amy Muse in the Sexual Health and Relationships Lab. And so broadly, my research interests are focused on romantic relationship initiation and maintenance over time. And so given this sort of relevance, today I'll be giving a guest lecture related to the attraction and close relationships chapters from the textbook. And so let's just dive right in. Uh, so as a brief overview today, I'll be covering attraction um, and focusing on why we're attracted to others and how this can sort of stem from our intrinsic need to belong. And I'll also discuss four of the most frequently studied factors of attraction that can influence how people become interested in others. And given that my interests lie in the initiation of romantic relationships, I'll finish off this section by discussing some of the factors that can influence how we end up deciding who to initiate a romantic relationship with. And after this, I'll discuss close relationships and talk about attachment theory, which is one of the most prominent and influential theories in the field of relationship psychology. And I'll also discuss how love is often described and studied and the ways in which we can maintain long-term committed relationships. And I'll finish off this section by discussing singlehood, which really is the opposite of close relationships. However, it is an area that has been getting a lot of attention recently and I think talking a bit about it is important and can be really interesting. So let's begin by discussing attraction and think a bit about why we may be attracted to others and why we as humans may intrinsically gravitate toward forming social relationships with others. So psychologists believe that one of the reasons we're attracted to and form relationships with others is due to our fundamental need to belong. So whether this is with family members, romantic partners, or friends, we need these bonds to maintain a satisfied life. And this isn't a need in the same way that people may say they need their phones with them throughout the day. This is a psychology, uh, psychological need. And so in the textbook, this is described as a mechanism for regulating behavior to acquire tangible or intangible resources necessary for survival and well-being. And in other words, our need to belong can sort of be described similar to something like hunger. So people may feel lonely, so they'll act in ways to satisfy this need, such as making new friends. However, if we um, if we don't try to become, uh, we don't try to become. However, similar to hunger, we won't eat if we're feeling full and we don't try to become friends with everybody that we meet as we only act until our need to belong is satisfied. And the need to belong also has an evolutionary basis. Um, so in early humans, people who formed close social bonds were more likely to survive various threats, such as starvation, predators, illness, and so forth. And they were also more likely to procreate and their children were more likely to survive. As we know, children rely on care and protection for many years before being able to fend for themselves. And there's also evidence that this need to belong is universal as cross-cultural research has found evidence that all cultures share this need to belong. And also, as I already hinted at, our need to belong is vital for our physical and mental health. Um, so compared to people who live more isolated lives, people with healthy bonds with their friends, lovers, family, coworkers, or whoever else have higher levels of self-esteem, happiness, satisfaction with life, and better mental and physical health. On the other hand, people who are isolated for long periods of time show poorer mental and physical health. So that is people who experience loneliness, feel higher stress, um, a greater likelihood to turn to substance abuse, greater likelihood of mental health problems such as depression and eating disorders, and have poorer physical health overall. 
So now that we have got a grasp of why we form intimate relationships with others, let's discuss some of the prominent ways in which we become attracted to others. Um, so the main ways include proximity, similarity, physical attractiveness, and physiological arousal. So starting with proximity, um, so this can be described as the physical nearness of others. And this makes a lot of sense as you can't really form a relationship with someone unless you meet them. And well, you're more likely to meet someone that is proximal to you. Um, of course, this has changed a bit now with the internet. Um, we're really able to make and maintain connections with people all over the world, despite being physically distant. Um, however, there is this uniqueness to the relationships we form with others in person. Um, so this may be a reason why some things like dating apps still rely on proximity to match you with others that are geographically close to you. So a really interesting study that explored how proximity can play a role in who we form relationships with is the Westgate Housing Study. Um, so this study took place in a housing complex for married students at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and in this study, the researchers tracked friendship formation among the students in 17 buildings, um, each with 10 apartments in a housing complex that was isolated from the city. And so these residents were randomly assigned to their apartments as vacancies opened up and nearly all of them were strangers when they moved in. And so they're really just trying to figure out who ends up liking whom and who ends up being friends with one another. So they found that whether or not people became friends um, had a lot to do with how close they lived together. So people were twice as likely to become friends with the person who lived next to them compared to the person that lived another door down. And overall, they were more likely to become friends with people in their building rather than people who lived in other buildings. So one of the reasons proximity works to form relationships is that we have to have initial contact with people to form a relationship. Um, and proximity makes this contact more likely. But another reason is due to this mere exposure effect. Um, or our tendency to like novel stimuli more after we have been repeatedly exposed to them. So past work had uh, pairs of strangers come to the lab to chat between one and eight times, and the more times that people talked, the more they liked each other. Um, and this was measured through increased comfort and familiarity with one another through self-report measures. Um, but even though you know, I'm suggesting to you now that people like each other, the more often they see one another, it's important to keep in mind that there are some exceptions to this. Uh, so, if you're some, so if you form a negative impression of someone initially, such as thinking the person is annoying, um, repeated interactions could exacerbate these negative feelings and lead you to like them less as you sort of interact with them more. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind that the mere exposure effect does not always work in a positive way. So next, uh, let's talk about another major factor in predicting attraction, which is similarity. Um, so there's often this debate as whether opposites attract, or as the old saying goes, birds of a feather flock together. However, uh, more consistently, uh, research suggests that people are more attracted to others more similar to them. And so one funny example of this is a dog study where researchers were interested in seeing whether people are able to match owners and their pets uh, to one another through pictures. So they had um, participants randomly match sort of these pictures of owners and their pets, and they found that 64% of the time, uh, which isn't tremendous, but it is higher than chance, <clears throat> random strangers were able to match owners with their dog. And although this study was correlational and the effect is not really huge, the results suggest that people may be attracted to pets that appear similar to themselves, suggesting that people do have some attraction toward similar others. And so focusing back on people, uh, so there was a study that recruited 1,000 married couples to provide information about themselves on 88 characteristics, 
such as their social class or religion, and they compared the characteristics of married partners to randomly generated couples, and they found that actual couples were more similar to one another compared to these randomly generated couples on 66 of the 88 characteristics. And interestingly, interracial and interethnic couples were more similar to one another in personality traits than couples of the same race and ethnicity. So this suggests that people could sort of compensate for dissimilarity on one dimension by seeking out similarity on others. So if people are from different racial groups or ethnicities, it may be important for them to feel like they are matched on other characteristics, suggesting that having some similarity um, or a common ground can be an important piece for relationships. And a, another example of this is a study that explores whether we could be attracted to <clears throat> what they called this phantom other, um, which really is this hypothetical other that we don't know um, based on how similar we think we are to them. So the researchers created a fake description and manipulated how similar this phantom other was to the participant. They found that people were more likely to like others they were more similar to, and that this was also the case for real people that we have not met yet or have not gotten to know yet. And so why do we value similarity and how does this work? Well, similarities with another person facilitates a smooth interaction. Um, of course, conflicts of interest are inevitable in any relationship, but having similar attitudes such as similar religious or political views can allow for a more harmonious interaction with less frequent conflict compared to if people had opposing views. Um, and we also have this expectation of reciprocal liking from others more similar to us given our shared interests or values. So given that research has found we have this desire to be liked and to fear of rejection, we're motivated to interact with others we suspect may be more likely to like us. And lastly, similar others reinforce our identity. So we tend to hold onto our views and opinions and may consider them to be right such as our perspective on climate change, for example. Um, and so when we meet someone similar, we feel comfort in knowing that they share a similar perspective to us, and this also reinforces our own beliefs. And I kind of hinted to this a bit earlier, but what about opposites? Um, so there are certainly individual differences in this, as I'm sure many of you are thinking, my partner, my partner and I are very different and I love it. Um, well, there, there is work that suggests um, opposites can attract. However, it more, more likely is something like complementarity rather than a stark opposition to one another. So sort of this idea that, you know, your partner is extroverted and you're shy. Um, so rather than being opposites, you're sort of just complementing one another's styles. Um, and it might also seem like um, people are opposite to one another, but overall they may tend to be more similar than different to the people they're attracted to, and they may also become more similar over time. So next let's talk a bit about physical attractiveness. Um, and so this is certainly a huge factor as the beauty business is huge. And when we consider things like dating apps, the quality of photos of potential partners can play a significant role in who we may swipe right or left on. And so physical attractiveness is often one of the first filters for people that we meet. And so the role of evolution plays a role again, such that beauty and physical attractiveness can signal health and fitness. Um, however, it's also important to note that there can be some individual and cultural differences in what people value in terms of physical attractiveness and what characteristics uh, people may consider to be attractive. And so one of the ways research has assessed physical attractiveness, which seems to be preferred um, across different cultures and ethnic groups is through facial symmetry. And so facial symmetry is the preference for symmetrical faces 
which can be evaluated through measurements of different parts of a person's face, such as their ear to nose or the top of their forehead. And symmetry can be an indicator of physical health. And past work has found that people with symmetrical faces get sick less often and have better physical and mental health. And so an example of someone with a very symmetrical face is Beyonce. So looking at the image here, we can see her normal face first on the very left, followed by her face when the right side is mirrored in the middle, and then her face when the left side is mirrored on the far right. Um, and overall, her face looks nearly identical across all three of these photos. And although people... And although past research suggests that people value symmetry in faces, this doesn't mean that you need to have a symmetrical face to be considered physically attractive. Um, so for example, here are some mirrored images of Marilyn Monroe, who is often considered one of the most beautiful women of all time. And we can see through these three different, uh, three different photos that she doesn't really have a very symmetrical face. So beyond just facial symmetry, there are certain characteristics for men and women that make for a more attractive man or woman, but these can obviously vary based on culture and individual differences of what people find attractive. Um, but anyways, for men, this includes large eyes, small nose, and a large chin. So looking at some examples from popular media, uh, People Magazine recently announced that Paul Rudd, was the sexiest man alive for 2021, which some of you may know from Marvel's Ant-Man. And last year it was Michael B. Jordan, who you may have seen in Creed or Black Panther. And the year before that was singer John Legend. Um, and so do you think they have these characteristics that I've just listed or share many characteristics amongst one another? Um, and there really is no right or wrong answer, but I think that physical attractiveness can vary and many combinations of physical features can be considered to be attractive. And so similarly for women, there are some features that are valued such as large eyes, a small nose and chin, prominent cheekbones and high eyebrows. Um, and sort of following through a similar example, for women it's not as easy because they don't really have this sexiest man alive equivalent but looking at a few of People Magazine's covers for the list of the most beautiful women, um, we see Lupita, um, who is also in Black Panther, but some of you may have seen her in 12 Years a Slave. Um, there's also Angelina Jolie, who is in the recent Marvel release, um, Eternals, and Halle Berry, who some of you may have seen in X-Men or John Wick. Um, but, but again, we see that these women may satisfy a lot of these characteristics that I've just listed, but they may not necessarily be required to be widely considered beautiful, as I'm sure you can identify some facial, facial characteristics that differ a bit between these women. And so what are other ways in which physical attractiveness can impact attraction? Um, While well, researchers have investigated what is called the halo effects or the beauty is good stereotype. Um, and so this is a common belief, whether it's accurate or not, that attractive people possess other positive qualities beyond just their physical appearance. Um, so another way to look at this is that the halo effect is a powerful stereotype in which we assume that physical attractiveness is highly correlated with other desirable traits. Um, so research has found that we think that attractive people are happier, um, more intelligent, more popular, and that they make more money um, compared to less attractive people. But why is this the case? Um, so are attractive people actually better at all of these things? And so research has shown that there is some truth to this. Um, so for example, people who are attractive tend to develop better social skills, However, this may be because they are treated differently. So attractive people tend to receive more attention and help when they need it, which creates a self-fulfilling prophecy whereby people's expectations about attractive people cause them to act in different ways, which then makes people confirm their original expectations. 
And beyond just physical attractiveness, it's also important to consider the effect of the situation. Um, so researchers have investigated the impact of physical attractiveness and context and found what they called the closing time effects. So researchers went to a bar and approached 103 men and women and asked them to rate um, the attractiveness of members of the opposite sex in the bar um, at three different time points. So at 9 p.m., 10.30 p.m., and at midnight, which at the time the study was conducted was when the bars closed. And what they found was that people were more attracted to members of the opposite sex at closing time. Um, and so what's important is that they found no difference between people who have or have not been drinking, such as it's not people just slowly getting more drunk as the night went on, um, but this perceived last opportunity to meet someone played a significant role in their perceptions of others. So next let's talk about the last factor, physiological arousal, or our body's response to others. And one of the most popular studies that explored physiological arousal is the Capilano Bridge study. Um, so let's check out a short video that describes this study. A high suspension bridge on a windy day is just the place to put Art Aaron's theory to the test that danger can provoke passion. We had an attractive young woman stand on this scary bridge, and every time a young man would walk across by himself, she would stop him and say, Excuse me. I'm doing an experiment for my psychology class on the effects of exposure to scenic attractions on creative expression. Would you mind filling out this questionnaire for me, please? Here's a pen. Almost all the men agreed to do it. After all, it was an attractive woman asking a man to do something. They didn't want to admit they were scared. And then I have a picture for you to look at. And I'd like for you to write a brief dramatic story based on this photograph. So the man would write the story, and when he was done, she'd say, Thank you. I appreciate uh -huh. your time. And I would love, I don't have a whole lot of time now, but I'd love to explain um, the experiment in more detail when I do have more time. So um, I'm going to give you my number, and then you can feel free to call me. It's at my hotel. Okay. So she would write her name and phone number on the edge of her little sheet, tear it off, and hand it to her. Right, great. Well, my name's Linda, so um, okay. I hope you call me. Okay, Linda. Thanks. Thanks. She stopped 20 men on the scary bridge, and then she stopped another 20 men on another bridge that was a big, heavy, safe bridge, not very scary at all. I am doing a project for my psychology class on the effects of exposure to scenic Of the men who met her on the scary bridge, many more phoned her that night than the ones who met her on the safe bridge. The other thing we did is we looked at the stories they wrote far more romantic and sexual content when they met the woman on the scary bridge. She's embarrassed because her boyfriend wants to marry her. Then when they met the very same woman on the safe bridge. I think this woman is a little embarrassed about something that's really not that important at all. Aaron believes that when our heart is pounding in our chest, we unconsciously look for the most attractive explanation. And if an attractive person of the right sex is standing by, then we're happy to assume we've fallen in love. So, as seen in the video, people who crossed the scary bridge were more likely to contact the experimenter later, and the reason for this may be due to the misattribution of arousal effect. So this is where people may associate their physiological arousal caused by an activity or some other stimuli to something else, such as the experimenter in this study. This suggests that contexts in which we are engaging in activities that are more physiologically arousing can lead to greater feelings of attraction to others. Um, so maybe things like various sports, working out, or awe-inspiring views in nature can increase our physiological arousal and lead to greater feelings of attraction to other things or people around us. And so, as I mentioned, given that my research interests lie in the realm of romantic relationships, I just wanted to finish this section by discussing romantic partner selection um, to sort of frame how these things that attract us to people or other criteria that we use 
um, to evaluate others can influence who we select as a romantic partner. So although there are different factors that can influence our attraction to others, people also often consciously value certain characteristics that may guide who they pursue in romantic relationships. And so a popular theory is the ideal standards model, which proposes that people possess an ideal level of traits that they want um, in potential partners, and they sort of use this to evaluate potential partners. Uh, so this model proposes that people evaluate others on three constructs. Um, so this is warmth and trustworthiness, vitality and attractiveness, and their status or resources. And so a speed dating study, which had people go on nine to 13 four minute speed dates, um, and then rate the date across these different um, ideal standard characteristics, aim to answer whether people's preferences predicted mate selection. Um, and what they found was no. Um, so actually there was no link between what people said they wanted before the event and who they actually decided um, to date or express interest in after the speed dating event. Um, so this kind of highlights the complexity of selecting a romantic partner and how it may not be as simple as someone sort of checking the boxes of what we value or just weighing the pros and cons of our options like other decisions in our lives. Um, so as we saw when discussing some of the factors that influence attraction, this also highlights the importance of context and the ways in which we interact with people. So whether we're engaging in a physiologically arousing activity or near the closing time of a bar, this can influence the decisions we make and how we evaluate others. Um, and we also know that people are complex uh, and two people that may be identical in their characteristics and values may be very different when you engage and interact with them. And so an exciting new area of research that I'm beginning some work on is romantic chemistry or this unique and intense connection you may feel with someone. Um, and although I have not done a lot of work on this area yet, we suspect that chemistry will capture some of these unique components from interacting with others that aren't captured by only investigating the qualities that each person may have. Um, so we're really excited to start this line of work and see whether um, chemistry is a better predictor of who people select to um, pursue as a romantic partner. So with that, let's move into discussing close relationships. Um, so close relationships encompasses the bonds formed with family, friends, or romantic partners that tie together two or more people over an extended period of time. And so while attraction from our initial so while attraction is from our initial feelings and impressions about other people, with that, let's... With that, let's move into discussing close relationships. Um, so close relationships encompass the bonds formed with family, friends, or romantic partners that tie together two or more people over an extended period of time. And so while attraction from our initial feelings and impressions about other people draws us towards uh, one another, close relationships focus on the more enduring relationships among family members, close uh, friends or romantic partners. And so let's begin by discussing love and romantic relationships. And I just want to show a short video of Art Aaron, a prominent research in the field of relationship psychology. Um, and you may be familiar with him as he was one of the researchers that conducted the Capilano Bridge study. And he discusses the importance of studying relationships, what love is, and some of his interesting work. Was a graduate student here at Cal and first year in social psychology and the culture of social psychology is find a topic that people don't think can be studied scientifically and do it scientifically. So during that year it happened to my great fortune that I fell in love 
actually I fell in love with Elaine Aaron, who I've been living with and collaborating, uh, and my wife, for many, many years since then. Her success, and it's a huge predictor of health. How long we'll live is predicted more strongly by your relationship quality than by smoking or obesity. We're confident that this procedure of answering 36 questions that gradually get more and more personal that both people answer, as well as a few other items in there like saying what you have in common, things you like about the other, that when you do these things, you're going to feel closer to the other person. Now, does that make falling in love? It could contribute to it. Part of falling in love is feeling a connection. Certainly, if many other things are in place and this happens, it could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. We know these 36 questions get people closer. That can facilitate falling in love. If this is an appropriate person for you, probably good to facilitate falling in love. Um, if they're not, though, you have to be careful. They could reject you. They could not be a good partner for you. The relationship research I've done over the years that I'm proudest of, uh, the earliest one is what we call the arousal attraction effect. If you run in place for 10 minutes or you're on a scary bridge and you meet a reasonably attractive person, you say, oh, I'm feeling attracted to them. A second one is uh, when you're in a long-term relationship after a few months, doing things that are exciting, challenging, novel with the partner sort of reinvigorates that sense of love and excitement. Third thing is we've identified the parts of the brain that become active when you are thinking about or looking at a picture of someone you're intensely in love with. Uh, something that shows up even in very long-term couples that are very intensely in love. Finally, uh, of the major things is what we call including other in the self. When you're in a close relationship with someone, they become part of who you are. If Just like when a mother uh, has her child injured, she feels it physically. This is true in all close relationships. Cool. So now that we've learned a bit about why it's important to study love and some of the prom uh, some of the work that has been done by prominent researchers in the field, let's begin by discussing attachment theory, one of the most um, popular theories in relationship psychology posed by John Bowlby. So given that our need to belong is deeply rooted in our biology and evolution, attachment theory sort of just builds on this. Um, so the main idea behind this is that babies are vulnerable and they survive by developing uh, attachment to caregivers. And one of the key premises is that infants depend on their caregiver for care and protection. And to also to develop a sense of security, which allows them to explore their environment. Um, however, parents are not always available and responsive to their children's needs. Um, so a responsive and available parent helps children form a safe haven through comforting infants when they are scared or worried, as well as build a secure base that supports infants while they explore um, the environment around them. And so depending on the caregiving uh, parents, sorry, depending on the caregiving parents provide to children, they may form one of three attachment styles. And so a secure attachment will form if infants feel they can rely on their caregiver in times of need, while an anxious attachment style will form. And depending on the caregiving parents provide to children, they may form one of three attachment styles. So a secure attachment will form if infants feel they can rely on their caregiver in times of need, while an anxious attachment style will form if Infants feel they can sometimes rely on their caregiver, but their caregiver is a bit unpredictable. And an avoidant attachment style may form where an infant feels their caregiver is generally unresponsive. So one way to test infants and children's attachment style is through the strange situation procedure, which was developed by Mary Ainsworth, um, a student of John Bowlby. So let's just check out a short video that discusses how the strange situation procedure works.
Ainsworth's strange situation includes eight stages, each lasting roughly three minutes. To start with, the mother, baby and researcher are all together in the room, a small, neutrally coloured space with some toys for the baby to play with. The experimenter leaves after around a minute, and the mother and baby are alone for approximately three minutes. In this stage, researchers are watching to see whether the child is confident to explore the new environment, or whether she stays close to the mother. A stranger joins the mother and baby in the room. The researchers record the baby's response to this unfamiliar newcomer, who is left alone with the baby when the mother leaves the room. At this stage, the researchers are observing the baby's behaviour for signs of separation anxiety. Three minutes later, the mother returns and the researchers observe for the baby's reunion response. The stranger leaves the room. A few minutes more, and the mother leaves the room too, leaving the baby alone for the first time in the experiment. The next person to enter the room is the stranger. And finally, after three minutes, the mother returns and the stranger leaves. All in all, a perfectly strange situation for all involved. So, what were the researchers measuring? When the mother was in the room with the baby, they scored the infant's behaviour on four measures. Proximity and contact seeking, contact maintaining, avoidance of proximity and contact, and resistance to contact and comforting. The baby's exploratory behaviours were also recorded as she explored the environment. Ainsworth reported that infants display one of three attachment types. Securely attached infants showed distress when separated from their mother, were avoidant of the stranger when alone, but friendly in the presence of their mother, and were happy when the mother returned from outside the room. 70% of children studied fell into this category. 15% of children demonstrated an ambivalent attachment with their mother. These children showed intense distress when the mother left the room and demonstrated a significant fear of the stranger. When the mother returned to the room, ambivalent children approached the mother but rejected contact. Ainsworth reported that a final 15% had an avoidant attachment style. Such infants show no interest when the mother leaves the room and play happily with the stranger. When the mother returns, avoidant children barely seem to notice. In 1990, Main and Solomon added that a very small percentage Ainsworth's strange situation includes And so, as we saw in the video, in this procedure, infants and their caregiver entered an unfamiliar room with lots of toys. Uh, the infant will play with the toys and a stranger will enter the room. The caregiver will leave the room and this separation may cause the infant distress and the caregiver will return later um, and sort of try to comfort the baby. And so the main focus was how caregivers interact with the baby when they come back into the room. And we can see in secure interactions, caregivers respond quickly and reliably to distress cries. Um, in anxious attachments, which if you saw in the video, it's also sometimes called anxious ambivalent. That's why it said ambivalent attachment. Um, so caregivers were not consistently reliable in this case, and sometimes were intrusive or rejecting. And in the avoidant attachment case, caregivers were fairly consistently unreliable and unresponsive to the infant's needs. And yeah, so this is just a really cool study to understand how we can form different attachment styles from such a young age. Um, but how is this relevant for us now as adults? Uh, well, John Bowlby claimed that our attachment styles or working models of relationships from early in life shape our relationships from the cradle to the grave. Um, and you may have seen some overlap in how you interact with your primary caregiver growing up and how you feel with people you interact with in adulthood. And there is evidence for this cradle to the grave claim as researchers have investigated adult romantic attachment styles and have found evidence for similar styles. 
So focusing on these three attachment styles again, let's discuss some of the findings surrounding how these attachment styles can influence our romantic relationships as adults. So using survey research, there are various questionnaires that you can take um, to get a better understanding of your adult romantic attachment style. So when considering secure attachment, um, items on the survey will often include things like, I find it relatively easy to get close to others, and people with a secure attachment are more satisfied in their romantic relationships. Um, they trust their partner more and they have less doubts of their partner's commitment. Um, for anxious attachment items, things include, I find that others are reluctant to get as close as I would like. And so this desire for closeness, but hesitancy. Um, so anxious people are more hypervigilant to how their partner is feeling and what they are doing and they tend to interpret things in a threatening way. And avoiding attachment items include, I'm somewhat uncomfortable being close. And so although we may have this need to belong and evolutionarily driven desire for closeness, um, some people may feel uncomfortable with being close to others. Um, so avoiding people are just less physically affectionate with their partners and more wary of closeness and intimacy. So now that we've discussed how attachment can develop early in infancy and sort of carry on to influence our lives as adults, let's continue to discuss factors that are relevant to the lives of many adults. Um, so namely, let's talk about love. Um, so in the textbook, it's described as this strong positive feeling we have towards someone or something we care deeply about. And love also often includes um, this feeling that can't be defined or can't be expressed, but we just really feel it. And so one of the most common ways to investigate and research, uh, conduct research on love is in these two components, um, passionate love and companionate love. So passionate love includes feelings of intense longing with physiological arousal. Um, so when it is reciprocated, we feel fulfillment and ecstasy. However, when it's not, we can feel despair. And on the other hand, companionate love is described as the feelings of intimacy and affection we feel for another person whom we care deeply for. Um, so this can include high affection and trust and value for that person, but this uh, typically includes diminished or absent levels of passion. So when we consider relationships over time, Passionate love can often peak early in a romantic relationship and sort of decrease over time, uh, while companionate love often starts relatively low at the beginning of the relationship and then increases over time. And past research suggests that companionate love lasts long term in romantic relationships, and people in long term relationships often mention that their spouse is their best friend and that they like their spouse as a person. Um, so sort of this deeper level of love beyond just this um, physical attraction or physiological arousal that is sort of characteristic of passionate love. And so when we're trying to maintain a long-term romantic relationship, it seems it is important to develop companionate love for one's partner. However, commitment is also a key factor. And so the social exchange model of commitment is a popular model that highlights three major factors of commitment. Um, so these are satisfaction or how happy you are with the relationship, alternatives or how happy you would be in another relationship or alone, as well as your perceptions of the availability of alternatives. And lastly, investment. Um, so what have you put into this relationship that you would lose if the relationship were to end? Um, and this could be things like time you've already spent together, shared assets, um, children, and so forth. And so the investment model um, of commitment incorporates all of these factors and suggests that people who are highly satisfied have made a lot of prior investments into their relationship and do not perceive that they have many attractive alternatives to their current relationship are more committed to their partners. Um, and so this will sort of influence their decision to stay or leave in a relationship. And in the case that I just described, they'd be more likely to stay. And so these 
three factors have been found to account for 90% of the variance in commitment, um, suggesting that the vast majority of differences in how committed people feel in their relationship can be predicted using this model. Um, and commitment has just been found to be one of the best predictors of whether people will stay in a relationship or end it. And so a final model I want to discuss that has been developed to better understand who may have satisfying relationships and who may be more likely to break up is the vulnerability stress adaptation model. Um, so the vulnerability stress adaptation model attempts to integrate various components to predict how relationship satisfaction can change over time and influence relationship stability. And so the model presented here looks a bit different from what is presented in your textbook. And this is actually from a paper that came out earlier this year from the authors where they updated the uh, vulnerability stress adaptation model. So let's just break this down a little bit. Um, so this model suggests that the enduring qualities that people possess, such as their agreeableness or their attachment style, can influence a couple's relationship satisfaction and stability um, indirectly through the way that they deal with external stress and the adaptive processes that they may use. And so these adaptive processes can include various things such as a person's responsiveness to their partner or how they navigate conflict. And so the key difference with this updated model is that the external stressors that people experience, such as work-related stress or marital conflict, can impact both the ways in which people use adaptive processes, as well as the ways in which adaptive processes influence relationship satisfaction. Um, and so sort of shown by the arrows in between, uh, sorry, the arrows coming from external stress pointing towards the arrows between adaptive processes and enduring qualities and adaptive processes and relationship satisfaction. And so what this means is that depending on the level of stress people may be experiencing um, can influence the effectiveness of these adaptive processes on relationship satisfaction. Um, and this also means that the likelihood that someone's enduring qualities influences their use of certain adaptive processes can vary depending on the extent to which they experience external stressors. And so to integrate some of the work I have done, um, so I've explored how charisma and enduring quality that people may possess can influence relationship satisfaction. So charisma has been found to be a desired quality when people describe their ideal partner. However, past work has not yet explored whether charismatic people are able to have more satisfying romantic relationships. So I tested whether charisma described in my work as someone who is likable and influential can indirectly influence um, sexual and relationship satisfaction and stability through the use of certain adaptive processes. Um, in my work, I tested an expanded model that's really too big to fit on the screen um, that's influenced by this vulnerability stress adaptation model to sort of better understand the relationships of charismatic people. Um, but I'll focus on only one half of the model today. So I tested whether being or having a charismatic partner, so I tested whether being charismatic or having a charismatic partner was associated with higher relationship satisfaction um, through the use of better conflict resolution strategies when couples experience conflict. And so overall, I found that being charismatic was associated with higher relationship satisfaction and there was evidence that charismatic people used more positive conflict resolution strategies, such as compromising and fewer negative ones, such as launching personal attacks at one's partner. And so the sort of the key takeaway from this was that being charismatic did not have a direct influence on relationship satisfaction, but instead it was this indirect pathway through the use of better conflict resolution strategies that allowed for higher relationship satisfaction. And so although we may not all be charismatic, um, we can certainly put an effort into using more adaptive relationship processes to better maintain our relationships. 
And although we have talked about commitment and how individual differences can influence uh, our relationship quality and stability over time, as I mentioned, the main point of the findings from our study that use this sort of adaptation of the vulnerability stress adaptation model was to highlight the adaptive processes and behaviors that all people can engage in to maintain a satisfying romantic relationship. So I just want to discuss some of the ways in which we can engage in things to keep the spark alive in our romantic relationships. And so the first is to acknowledge your partner's triumphs and accomplishments and to capitalize on these. Um, so when your partner comes to you and tells you about something great that just happened to them, share those moments with them and celebrate these accomplishments. Um, so there's a ton of research that suggests the importance of social support and more recent work suggests that communicating our enthusiasm to our partners when they accomplish things is associated with greater relationship satisfaction. And the second is to focus on the things you can give to your partner rather than what you can get. So be willing to make sacrifices for your partner. And importantly, this doesn't mean giving up everything for your partner. And it doesn't mean to make sacrifices to avoid conflict with your partner. Um, sacrificing for the right reasons, that is sacrificing to pursue positive experiences with your partner, has been linked to higher relationship satisfaction. And related to sacrifice, showing gratitude and appreciation towards one's partner and their actions contributes to making a relationship last. So this includes showing a sense of appreciation for what your partner does for you. Um, so thing, uh, small things in daily life, like washing the dishes or taking care of you when you're sick, um, as well as showing appreciation for who our partner is as a person. Um, so greater gratitude towards one partner, uh, one's partner has been consistently linked to being happier in relationships and relationship longevity. And so the final piece to help maintain a satisfying relationship is self-expansion or trying new things with one's partner. Um, since this is also covered in your textbook, I'm going to go over this in a bit more detail. So self-expansion is an area of research that is flourishing right now in relationship science, and it'd be the thing I'd recommend the most strongly for keeping the spark alive in your long-term relationships. Um, trying new things is relatively easy to do, and partners who seek out positive experiences in their relationships, like having fun and trying new things together, have been found to have more satisfying and longer lasting relationships. So the self-expansion theory of romantic relationships shows us that in new relationships, people who are rapidly, uh, sorry, the self-expansion theory of romantic relationships shows us that in new relationships, people are rapidly expanding their sense of self and we quickly learn new things about our romantic partner. And this makes us learn a lot, of, uh, a lot more about ourselves as well. So we start to incorporate our partner into our sense of self and develop greater self-other overlap between our identity and our partners. And according to this theory, in long-term relationships, we can maintain high satisfaction by engaging in activities with our romantic partner that enables us to keep expanding our sense of self. And so a study on novel and arousing activities had couples come into the lab and complete a measure of relationship satisfaction. Uh, these couples were then randomly assigned to one of two conditions. So one where they completed a novel arousing task. So this task included completing an obstacle course, but the couple had their wrists and ankles bound together and had to carry a pillow between their heads or bodies. Um, so this was definitely a novel task that was physiologically arousing for couples. And the second group completed a mundane task um, designed to be as similar as possible to the other task, but just less novel and arousing. Um, so this mainly involved walking back and forth on gym floor mats and rolling a ball to each other. So after the task, couples reported their relationship satisfaction again, and the researchers found that 
couples in the mundane task group became less satisfied with their relationship after completing the task. Um, this is likely because the couple viewed their relationship as exciting when they got to the lab, but after doing this boring task, their perspective may have shifted. Uh, but the key point here, though, is that the couples that did the novel arousing task became more satisfied with their romantic relationship. And so this may sound a bit extreme, um, but some of the work from our lab suggests that these tasks don't need to be um, out of the ordinary, like this weird obstacle course um, or something extreme like skydiving. Um, even daily changes in our relationship, such as trying to cook a new recipe with your partner or going on a walk somewhere uh, new can increase people's satisfaction, passion, and sexual desire. And so although this section is focused on close relationships, I just want to finish by discussing an area that has been understudied in the realm of romantic relationships, which is singlehood. Um, and this sort of makes sense that it's understudied because relationship researchers are primarily interested in romantic relationships. So why would they study single people? Um, yeah, and I guess, so why would they study single people? Um, after all, there is a ton of research that suggests that satisfaction and the physical and mental well-being of people in happy romantic relationships is higher than people who are single. Um, but despite all of this, uh, the number of single people are on the rise. Um, and in fact, the number of single people currently outnumbers the number of people in relationships in Canada. Uh, so 52% of the Canadian population is single, separated, divorced, or widowed compared to 48% that are in some sort of relationship. And, and so single people are often stigmatized against, um, and people often think that single people are just people who aren't able to find a romantic relationship. However, some past work suggests that there is a sizable number of long-term singles that um, purposely have decided to be single. And what's often forgotten is that Although romantic relationships can be great for people's uh, well-being, an unhappy romantic relationship can be extremely detrimental. And so the outcomes of single people are better compared to um, people in unsatisfied romantic relationships. And lastly, I just want to talk about a study of single people in New Zealand. Uh, so the researchers were interested in whether people high in avoidance social goals, which is described as people who try to sustain their social relationships by avoiding relationship conflict and tension, um, are happier when they are single compared to when they are in a relationship. And so the main idea of this is that these people would have less problems to worry about, such as a partner cheating on them, and they would be more satisfied being single. So using a large sample of 4,211 people in New Zealand, uh, the researchers found that for people in a relationship, um, sort of indicated on the right of this graph here, they had similar levels of satisfaction regardless of their avoidance social goals. However, for people in, uh, on the left here, so the people that were single, if they were high in avoidance social goals, they were happier. Um, they were happier when they were single compared to people that were low in their avoidance social goals. And so this provides some evidence that single people can be just as happy as people in relationships, depending on their avoidance social goals. And broadly speaking, this was just meant to highlight that although healthy romantic relationships can have profound benefits for people's well-being, there is amounting evidence that single people can have just as satisfying of a life depending on their goals and values. Um, so people can sort of have these satisfying relationships through family members or friends and don't necessarily need to have um, a romantic partner to enjoy the benefits of um, social connection. However, overall, there's just a lot more research that needs to be done on single people. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, hopefully you've all gained a better understanding of why it's important to study attraction and close relationships and some of the research that has been done. Um, and if you have any questions at all about today's content or material I haven't covered that's in the textbook, um, please reach out to me. 
And also I've only discussed a small subset of romantic relationships research here today. So if this work really excites you or you're interested in my research or the work that is coming out of our lab, um, you can reach out to, be, uh, to me and I'd be happy to chat and share other cool things that have been done. Um, and best of luck with the rest of the semester.